Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Exercise Your Rights. Today, we are talking with all the Kiwis. This is the Kiwi episode. And we're going to be talking about Remains to be Told, Tales from Dark Achi Aroa. I've been practicing that. And with us, we have Dan Rabert. So we have Celine Murray. We have Denver Grinnell. Tim Jones, and we are hopefully going to have Tracy McBride, but if not, we will have a video message from her at the end. Welcome, you guys. I, I want all of you to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you have in this book. Um, and you can start, we'll, we'll start with Dan and we'll just kind of go around. Okay. Um, thanks, Angela. Thanks for having us on. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, so my name's Dan Raybert. So I'm an a, a author, a editor, Short story writer. I've collaborated in the past with, uh, with our dear friend Lee Murray on a number of number of projects, and um, and in this particular project, I have a a short story, a short story titled "Spare the Rod," um, which is a, a little bit of a little bit of urban uh, urban personal horror, I suppose, is maybe the best way to describe it. That's awesome. My name's Tim Jones. Um, I'm a writer, editor, anthologist. Um, I'm probably mainly a, a sort of mainstream and science fiction writer who occasionally dips his toes into, into horror. And um, I have a poem in this anthology, uh, which is called Guiding Star. And it's... Um, it's it's based on a mixture of some unpleasant childhood personal experiences. Don't worry, the, the poem is not a literal retelling of what happened to me, um, and um, the uh, the nature of the place it's set in. So I thought that would fit quite nicely with this anthology. Nice, nice. How about you, Celine? Um, my name is Celine Murray. I uh, have uh, written short stories my whole life but I've just recently started getting into poetry so I have a poem in this book. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be in it because I think New Zealand flavour is really fun um, and I am a New Zealander even though I sound a little bit like I might not be. <laughs> um, and my poem is uh, is called Faithiri and it, it comes from uh, a myth about the goddess Faithiri who was a cannibal. Oh nice. That's it. You can tell it's a horror audience because the response is, oh, nice. Not, ooh. <laughs> How about you, Denver? Yeah, kia ora, everybody. My name's Denver Grinnell. I'm a writer. I just I write horror pretty much. That's what I write. Um, um, I'm a musician. Um, but, yeah, no, my story, Nahiri Gold, is in Remains to be Told. Um, the title of the story was named after a rather disgusting New Zealand beer, which we used to drink back in the day and would always make everyone sick. <laughs> but um, I've just sort of taken that title and applied it to something else for this story. So, yeah. So what was the beer? What was the name of the beer again? The name of the beer was Nahiri Gold. Um, oh, it was a Christchurch okay. brewery. I won't name the brewery, but it's a Christchurch brewery. that, And it was like cheap, nasty beer that would always make everyone very sick. And okay. students drink. Yeah, they, my husband's Australian and he says that's Foster's. So. <laughs> yeah, it's probably more drinkable than Nahiri Gold. Okay, so now the challenge accepted. I need to try some. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to try to pronounce this again. Ati Aroa. What is, am I pronouncing that correctly? Ati Aroa. Ati Aroa. Ati Aroa. Aroa. You're pretty close. Okay, listen to these guys. These guys are the experts. Don't try to say it like me. Uh, but what makes. <laughs> What is, can you tell us first what that is? Because most of us probably won't know in the audience and describe like what is, what is different about that type of horror? Because I know there's a lot of culture. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on the first question. Aotearoa is uh, the Maori name for, um, for New Zealand, so the pre-colonial name for New Zealand, and that means uh, land of the long white cloud. Um, the name came from the, um, the, the impression that uh, the, uh, the voyages coming across on the waka um, from the islands uh, got of uh, New Zealand when they saw it because there was the ocean and then there was there was a, a horizon of, of clouds and, and and then as we approached those clouds um, it turned out that well there was Aotearoa um, so that's that's where the name comes from. Nice, nice. Does anybody else have any any insight on that? Like anything you want to add about the cultural or what makes the Atiaroa horror so different. There's so many 
there's so many flavors and so many aspects um but obviously the land you know like you know, was referring to the the, the the land and the cloud and what just the, the landscape you know it's it's a small mm. rugged island you know um with lots of you know different topographies and and you know and just and weather systems and it just has this kind of um isolated but kind of raw yeah just raw rugged landscape and then obviously the people that have had populated it and how we've adapted to the land and and how that informs everything and then and then the stories kind of flow out from that and then you've also got the colonial history and you've got the maori history mm. and then that kind of all, it all went so yeah there's so many so many um leaves to, or branches to it yeah, just, just um, following on from what um, Denver just said about the about the landscape, there's a there's a line in Tim's poem actually, which um which jumped right out at me, where he uh, described a treachery of coastlines, and I just I just love that that description because it really does come up um, New Zealand, especially from the sea, especially from from that angle. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. For a small country, we have a very very long coastline. <laughs> immense numbers of bays, headlands. Um, the, probably the other thing to say about Aotearoa is that um, we range from, you know, the north is subtropical, um, mm. the, the very south, or perhaps subarctic, that's a bit strong, but there's nothing south of the south coast except a few small islands in Antarctica and the winds that blow up from there. So my, my poem is, is set near where I grew up, right down on the south coast. Awesome. All right. We have Tracy McBride in the studio, so I'm going to pop her back up. So hopefully you're ready, Tracy, because here you are. Uh-oh. <laughs> so we're going to let Tracy's video catch up. Um, Celine, did you have anything to add to that? Like, what are your impressions of Atia Roa? I'll say this sure. by the end of this whole show. <laughs> okay. um, with regards to horror specifically, when we were talking about the, the landscape, I think that New Zealand is unique in terms of the environment because there are such variables across the country and that can bring that, that tension in the, in the environmental horror that you're going to tell because things could change very quickly. And I think quite a lot of stories have um, almost the potential of, I'd say like an ecological consequence if you do something or like I suppose it could be anything with regards to horror if you do something that that deserves a consequence that could come from the environment which I think is is a fun mm -hmm. element. Mm -hmm. well yeah, and, 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 yeah and, and, and interesting point on on that from Celine as well um when we talk about the landscape it's, it's an interesting little factoid is uh, uh parts of New Zealand the the have the thinnest crust on the planet so we have we're very close to the underworld here um and that is quite foundational and fundamental in in maori mythology as well it's just the closeness that that humanity uh and the the animal kingdom has to to everything that goes on below the surface and that informs uh, a lot of um, a lot of the, the, the Maori folklore that, um, that 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 we that we draw on, uh, and it also um, informs our daily lives um, because we're actually constantly living with the worry of earthquakes and 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 volcanoes and and, and tsunami. Um, so we're yeah, there is a little bit of that constantly living on the edge um, with, yeah. with with that environmental side of things as well. Well, and I thought about making a Hobbit joke when you talked about living so close to the the edge, but I'll, I'll refrain. I'll just refer to you. I could have made a Hobbit joke. Um, I think that that's really important right now because as we're looking at the news globally, there is disaster after disaster everywhere. So I think globally, worldwide, we're kind of all starting to be aware, hopefully, hopefully, that yes, our actions are having consequences, but they're for, all, for us all and especially for you guys because it is such a sensitive ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe the other thing I'd add there is that um, it's also, uh, even though the, the um, continent, the mostly submerged continent of Zealandia has been around for a long time, a lot of Aotearoa, it, it's, it's not been above the sea that long. Uh, it's got very fast growing mountains, uh, as Dan mentioned, there's volcanoes, earthquakes, etc. It's a very dynamic landscape. So, and there's also the... 
in a lot of and I'm probably talking here more about about I so Pakia as means sort of the white white people who came in um, primarily the the British in a lot of um, mainstream literature at least there's the sense of isolation is very strong so I, I'm I don't think that's the case for Maori literature I'm not qualified mm -hmm. to speak on that but for Pakia writers still I think it's certainly back in the 20th century a lot of it was about how isolated people felt and of course we have a small population uh, even relative to our land area we have a small population so people often are physically isolated in very small settlements that can be easily cut off so just in terms of that you know the classic horror setting of a small group of people in a hostile or isolated environment it just kind of comes naturally here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and going and, and and going yeah and taking the people aspect you know like the the rugged landscape the isolation the people living in the land and then just how that affects them and how you know like i've, I've read i haven't read the book i haven't got the book yet but i've read you know everyone hears stories and like the characters you know there's just a rugged sort of like a, in your story dan the sort of the farming life the sort of that hardship you know the way it informs the people and then say in my story these two sort of like rougher cat not rougher cat yeah one one character's a bit rougher but you know like <laughs> and people go into the bush and you know there's just there's just that kind of i mean it's not i mean it's a flavor of new zealand because i mean i guess it's in, in in any country you've got that sort of that sort of those sorts of people but and it just that, that particular landscape and those particular kind of people it kind of just works together in a really nice sort of rugged way yeah well, I think you live in a landscape where everything that that's the big joke from you know the rest of the world is everything is poisonous there so or wants to eat you so, you're thinking of australia oh, you're you're thinking of australia yeah do you yeah. not have all the poisonous yeah. creatures in uh no oh okay no, no. so i feel like this no, he, is he to want to eat you. they just want to like fall on you oh like drop <laughs> here slide on top of where you live yeah i shouldn't say that because i live in the hillside in, in australia the animals want to kill you in new zealand the land wants to kill you oh yeah. okay so yeah so i don't know picking the animals or the land i don't know you know no wonder the hobbits left <laughs> well they went underground well, yeah exactly that's not where you want to be maybe um mm. i see that bleakness and that what you guys are describing a lot in the art um in the in the interior art with with this which is by emma weekly um, what did you guys think when you first saw the art that accompanied these stories and poems? Yeah, I was going to make that connection as well. I think that the art does have a lot of what Tim was talking yeah. about, the uh, really? isolated feeling. And I think that the, the artist did a really great job at, at showing you where people have been, but a lot of the art doesn't have anyone in it. And mm. I really enjoyed that mm. that angle. Yeah. It's, it's really mm. yeah. Yeah, especially like I'm looking at yours. What is what is the Watari, right? Watari. Watari. Yeah. yeah. What Celine said. <clears throat> yeah. yeah it's very bleak the art is, but it's it's very expressive as well because you've got kind of like a woman in the clouds. So yes, very beautiful. I can I can hold it up maybe if you can see it. Yeah, yeah. and I can actually share the art maybe if I share my screen, yeah. but I don't want to start lagging us out or anything in case maybe we can get Tracy back in. Um, but how about, um, I've lost my questions. Okay. Given that there is so much darkness in your country, and this is not a judgment on your country, just like what I'm being told, um, why do you think there's not more Kiwi anthologies? I mean, there's obviously a lot to tap here. Probably this probably a business related answer to that one. I think I think it has to do with the, it has to do with the, the small pool of 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 writers. Like um, I think that the, between the between the four of us here, we could probably sit down and and, and name out just about every horror writer in, in New Zealand if we we're asked to. Uh, and chances are we've all met. Um, so so there's that. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of horror writing. Um, in, in terms of volume being generated, but also there's a there's a there's a business side of it, and that it's not a large lucrative market, especially not in New Zealand. New Zealand has an extremely small publishing industry. I don't I don't know if we have very much in the way of of large press presence at all, which means most of our 
most of our publishing um, here is, is small press, and most of that small press very much tends to be literary focused. Um, so what we what we have found, we have had success, is, is collaborations with, especially with the, the Australian um, small press market, um, and also with the, the US um, indie press market, and our um, our writers getting out there and, and getting their works into into some of those bigger um, international markets as uh, in the short story side of things and, and selling novels as well. Um, so in terms of specifically coming out of New Zealand, um, it's it's simply a case of what's the volume, what's the what, what's the business imperative. Um, Tim, you're you're a little bit more involved in this. Do you wanna do you wanna contribute? Like, like add to that? Yeah, I mean, I suppose what I'd say as somebody who's had I guess I've had stuff published by both um, you know genre, well, genre it isn't really tr there are there are or have been genre publishers and I mean it actually seems to be there mm. have been quite a few horror anthologies over the year I know I know that you've been mm. involved in a number of them Dan in terms of yeah. um, I think right, <laughs> if I remember correctly in terms of editing um, yeah they Generally, though, I'd agree with Dan that the the publishers that you that publish not just literary fiction but nonfiction. I mean, nonfiction mm. sells a lot better. I I titled my second collection of poems "All Blacks Kitchen Gardens" because the three things that traditionally sell here are sports books, the All Blacks, the rugby team, <laughs> cooking books, and gardening books. I have to say, it didn't make any difference to the sales of the poetry collection. But, um, <laughs> So, so even literary fiction is kind of like the sales numbers are not huge, and I think for a for a mainstream New Zealand publisher to take a punt on a horror anthology, they would want to make sure that there was um, plenty of funding in place from funding organisations before they took that on. So, I, I, I tend to agree with Dan that that it's partly just a, a the size of the market. But the other thing I'd say, though, is that there's quite a lot of it might not identify itself as horror, but there's quite a lot of horror elements, even in mainstream mm. short fiction here mm. and, and some novels. I'll just use an mm. example as a writer called Ronald Hugh Morrison, who was around, I guess, in the 50s and 60s. He lived in a, a small town called Hawara, which he fictionalized in his work. And they're kind of, and I have to say, was not a nice person at all, um, but his work is still very into, engaging. It's kind of like horror comedy um, in a New Zealand context. Now, he wasn't marketed as a horror writer, but there's a lot of those elements in his work, several of which have been made into movies. So there is this, it's when I started writing, the wall between literary and genre was, you know, as high as the wall in Game of Thrones, and you weren't supposed to climb over it. That has changed a lot uh, mm. in terms of what people are willing to read, but there's still a bit of a divide between sort of genre publishers and mainstream or literary publishers. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think part of it is just people have a hard time defining what is genre and what is literary. You know, I hear that question all the time, well, what makes it genre, what makes it literary? And and it is, the lines are very much blurred. So, mm. and plus it I'm sounds gonna, so snooty and literary, you know. Um, sorry, I was just going to say, like, um, you know, there's also, New Zealand does have a, a, a strong history of horror comedy, more so in the, in the film realm. Yeah. Um, obviously, yeah. Peter Jackson, Meet the Feebles, Bad Taste, Brain Dead, um, and there's definitely been more recent ones, Deathgasm and Housebound. And so there is this really strong lineage that I don't know, has translated to fiction as such. I mean, I'm sure there. I'm sure it has. Um, probably not widely read enough, but um, but that's yeah. We've got this this dark side, and then we've also got this this really sort of larrikin sort of fun side as well. Which, well, which is, all, yeah. yeah, yeah. Welcome to all, of course. Yeah, what we do in the shadows. Um, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting that there's these, these two streams that kind of coexist and and can inform each other as well. But um, yeah, maybe maybe the next anthology is a horror comedy one, a New Zealand horror comedy. Yeah, yeah. I'd be in, I'd be definitely into that if somebody did that. Yeah. <laughs> well, there there you hear it, Dan, um, and whoever is behind here. <laughs> um, no, I think that's excellent. I think uh, I mean maybe comedy is very effective too because if they, everything is trying to kill you, you know, you have to just laugh at it or you're oh. gonna just be depressed. I mean. 
there's there's two ways you can go be depressed or laugh at it and go on mm. Mm. yeah i think australia and new zealand are quite similar in that way you know there is that, mm. that there are similar tensions but also a similar um ability to laugh at it and and just mm -hmm. you know yeah yeah and i think we we definitely are as as things are progressing um all of us are globally going to be needing a little more dark laughter maybe <laughs> Yeah. Some of the stuff that's happening. Well, I would love to hear some of this read. Um, for anybody who's watching, the links are in the description to go find this book. But if anybody feels prepared to read, that would be fabulous. Anybody? I mean, don't crowd all at once and like <laughs> find over this. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm 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 happy to happy to read it. Just give me a moment to find to find the spot that I uh, thought might work. Yeah, absolutely. And I can actually okay. give you the whole screen so that we can all just kind of relax and listen and not oh, try to look I'll smart as appreciate. we're listening. We can just relax and listen. Okay. All right. Uh, very good. Okay. So this is from, this is from um, uh, Spear the Rod and uh, uh, about, about halfway through the story. So sort of dropping into it. So a little bit of spoilers. I, I think I said, um, I said something about urban before, but I was uh, incorrect. This is a, it's a rural a little bit of rural horror is one of the things I've done over the years. A little bit of rural horror. So I'll just jump into where we are. The house was ominously dark and silent as he pushed through the sun porch, panting, kicking off his boots and shucking his jacket onto the floor. No boots and jackets in the house. That was the rule. He and Dad both used to get in trouble for that one. Afterwards, Dad still made sure they never broke it. Every time Nathan came in the back door, it was like he could hear her voice. Leave your boots in the porch and hang that jacket up. He hadn't hung his jacket, but this was an emergency. Mum would have understood. He stumbled into the empty, empty kitchen. His hands were shaking as he picked up the phone handset, hooked his finger into the dial and whipped it around three times. One, one, one. Waited for it to ring. Several agonising moments caught by before he realised it wasn't connecting. He hit the switch a few times to disconnect and try again, but there wasn't even a dial tone. Must be another slip, somewhere between here and wherever this one dropping a tree over the phone and power lines. That's why the house was dark, even though they'd left the porch and kitchen lights on when they went out to round up the flock. Nathan couldn't call for help. No one was going to come and rescue Dad. Head suddenly light, he dropped the receiver back into the cradle. Bring the gun. He stared hard at his reflection in the mirror on the wall behind the phone, hollow and haunted and running out of options. Your jacket won't get dry lying on the floor, Tummer. Nathan heard the voice, but it made no sense. The stresses of the moment playing tricks on his ears, a soft echo from lost days. He turned to face the old dining table and chairs. The overhead light wasn't on, but an ethereal glow washed the table. Mum was sitting there, hands wrapped around her tea mug, focused on something he couldn't see. Impossible wisps of steam drifted up in the invisible light. All thought, all words fled Nathan's head. He was cracking up. Mum wasn't there. He'd sat with her in the hospice while the machine blipped over from clinging to life to whatever darkness followed. He'd watched her die, helped lower her into the ground. She wasn't sitting at the table, quietly contemplating a cup of tea, telling him off for dumping his jacket. She really wasn't. Rain like this, Ua Nui, brings out the tanifa. Down in the creek it comes out to play when it floods. Got to watch it. It likes to mess with people something she used to say every time it rained hard. As a kid, he'd always wanted to go look at the creek and the big rains, see if he could spot the monster. As he got older, he'd come to understand the warning for what it was, the dangers of nature and the vulnerability of people. There wasn't really a tanifa living in the creek, lurking in wait for an opportunity to gobble people up, just legends to make sense of the world. Mum had grown up on this farm. Family roots went deep into the earth around here. Maybe, even though she was gone, part of her remains Maybe the brain brought her back. Maybe she was the tiny fire. You blacked out, Dan, so we can't see you anymore. But that was a fabulous reading. That was how intensely scary that was. It just screen gone. <laughs> I, I think that Dan is still with us. 
Um, does anybody else feel like reading? That was fabulous. I'm so excited to read this book. I'd be happy to read a couple of stanzas from uh, my poem, which is called Guiding Star. So just a little bit of it. Can I read from the middle of a poem, which is a slightly weird thing to do? Um, so my poem is um, set in a place called Omawi, which is in the south coast, but uh, uh, on the south coast of the South Island. Um, I went to a school, it's a real place, and I went to a school camp there. Uh, it was not an experience I enjoyed. Um, no reflection on Omawi, um, which is a, a very beautiful place. It's like regenerating bush on the south coast, but everything down there is dominated by the wind that sweeps up from Antarctica. It also so happens that it was it's next to a place called the New River Estuary, which has a lot of shoals, and there's a lot of shipwrecks there. And, and when I learned that one of those shipwrecks was a boat called the Guiding Star, I thought, right, got a poem here. So I'm just going to read a couple of stanzas from the middle of it where my, my character, who is not me but is uh, slightly based on me, <laughs> I wasn't courageous enough to escape from, from the camp because I hated it so much, but my character was. So this is what happens a little bit as they're uh, making their escape. Beneath the forest, it is darker. Trapped in the 1960s, you have no mobile, no Google Maps. All you have is dead reckoning and desperation to find the road to green hills, then the main highway that will take you home, some late night motorist who will show pity while you try to imagine what your father will say. But first, the forest. Night pulls around you. Ruru call in the distance, the low murmuring of wide-eyed, watchful predators. High above, where the forest thins, a single star hastens your stumbling steps downhill. So that's just a little taster of my poem. Oh, I like it. So then that's kind of a fantasy poem in a way of like what I could have done or what I should have done. <laughs> well, given it, uh, perhaps I shouldn't give it. Well, this is a horror anthology. So I think you say given the ending, I'm not sure what I should have done is necessarily <laughs> right. But what I could have done, maybe. Uh, awesome. And welcome back, Dan, um, which I think you could hear us. That was a fabulous reading. And yeah, Thank that you. was so good. It just wiped your camera out. Technology died at that <laughs> reading. <laughs> um, how about anybody else? Anybody else want to take a little shot at reading? I mean, it could be dangerous. It could like black your camera out or something. And, you know, we don't know what might happen. Apparently we're having the Eti Aurora ghosts. Eti Aurora ghosts. <laughs> Yes, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll have a read if you, if you don't mind. I'll read yeah, just the absolutely. First, love. The first part of my story, Nahiri Gold, is kind of like a it's a prologue. It's quite short, but it kind of sets the scene. Um, so, yeah, here we go. The campfire crackles and spits as the old man places another brunch of manuka on the burning pile. Orange sparks dance skyward in pursuit of the spiralling plume of smoke. The two children lie by the fire, wrapped in sleeping bags and rugs, the glow from the blaze flickering in their sleepy eyes. Remnants of the night's dinner is scattered on the ground before them. Greasy plastic plates, charred sticks that had held sausages, then marshmallows, over the flames and shredded tinfoil that still houses some potatoes, slow cooked in the embers. The old man reaches into his poncho, removes a thin bone flute and raises it to his lips. He blows softly on the koal, releasing a mournful tune into the air. His long fingers make subtle movements over the holes, causing the notes to waver slightly. The boy listens, transfixed by the plaintive melody. The old man lowers the flute and nods to the sky and then to the trees that surround the campsite. The song has ceased, but the magic it conjured remains, filling the air with its invisible aura. The boy breaks the silence. Koro, can you tell us a story? I just did, young one. Well, it was an ori ori, a lullaby. I want a scary story. The old man smiles. Tama, if I tell you a scary story, story you'll be up all night, and we can't be having that. This old timer needs his beauty sleep. Yeah, so does Tama, because he's U-G-L-Y, the girl teases. Marie, please. The old man's voice is warm but firm. She lowers her eyes. Sorry, Cordell. Yeah, shush, dunghead, the boy teases his sister. Before she can retaliate, the old man raises a leathery hand in warning. Quiet now, or you might wake up the mighty Kumi lizard. The girl's eyes widen. Seeing he has their attention, the old man continues. Kumi lizards are supposed to be extinct, but some say they still live out there in the bush, watching, waiting. 
Waiting for what, Coral? The girl asks. For someone to violate the sacred laws of the forest or break tapu by taking that which is not theirs. And then, he pauses for dramatic effect. And then the kumi come, and they get very hungry, you see, as there are only small creatures to eat in the bush, birds and bugs, the odd possum. But chubby tamariki like you would make a tasty feast indeed. He smacks his lips theatrically. The children giggle nervously. Tama will be eaten first. He's the chubbiest. The girl laughs at her brother. Shut up, the boy wails. He picked up a cold, uneaten potato and threatens to throw it at his sister. The old man's hand goes up once more, commanding silence. His left eyebrow rises at the same time, indicating his displeasure. The boy sheepishly puts the potato down. The kumi are placated by the songs of the bush. They don't want to hear the trivial bickerings of Tamariki. I think they must be extinct, or someone would have seen one, the girl says earnestly. Some say they retreated when man cut down the trees to make cities, towns, and farms. And some say the kumi were transformed by their anger and sadness, became hardened, vengeful. The smile drops from the girl's face. It's just a lizard, you wuss, the boy chortles. Hush, the old man warns. They could be watching us right now, so beware. A sly smile creeps across his face. And on that note, Timoy pie and sweet dreams. The old man lies down on his makeshift bed and pulls his red sleeping bag over his shoulders. There's a quiet chuckle and then silence. The children look at each other fearfully. The fire sputters as the gum in the manuka branches bubbles and pops. The siblings snuggle down on their foam bed rolls and stare at the stars glimmering through the treetops. More pork call out. Possums cackle in the darkness, taunting them. The boy folds his pillow over his ears to drown out the eerie choir of the night. He closes his eyes tightly. Eventually his fears give way to peaceful slumber. The children sleep, oblivious to the sharp cooing of the moorpork, or the old man snoring, or the padding of large feet creeping just beyond the periphery of the campsite, an unseen form retreating into the dark of the forest. And that's that. That's a pro that's that's kind of a, the, the prologue to the to the main story. Your microphone's off, Angela. <laughs> Sorry, I started muting myself because I was like, what if somebody could hear me if I sniffed and and I don't want to interrupt these excellent readings. So no, that was fabulous. So so now that we're all a little spooked out, we've had the the ghosts and the machine making us have the tech difficulties. We've heard all the horror stories. Um, if anybody else wants to throw in anything, read a little bit or anything, I would love it. I think that I am thoroughly and happily terrified and ready to go get this book. So, um, before we go though I want to find out a little bit about you guys and what else you have coming up because I know you're all busy writers and this is not all you're doing and I also just want to do a little shout out to the publisher Clandestine P Press right very clever name I thought that was really funny when I saw that so but yeah tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing and what else you have going on besides this book We'll just start. We'll, we'll start with De uh, Denver, and we'll just go around again in a circle. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'd recently self-published a collection of flash fiction. You know, I've been writing flash fiction for a few years now, and really enjoy it. And realized I had twenty. Well, yeah, I had a, quite a few stories, but I thought you know twenty thousand words is a good length of for a short book. So I released twenty thousand bloody words, which is literally 20, 20 short stories. Um, so that came out a couple of months ago, and yeah, now I'm working on the the Wellington release event with Lee for Remains to be Told, which we're, I think, Dan and Tim are gonna, both going to be at in, mm. in 11th, 12th of November. Um, so we're looking forward to that, yeah. And that's next to the next event. But then also next weekend is Halloween, so I've got a very busy busy weekend next weekend. Um, got two Halloween gigs that I'm sort of DJing at and um, going to the Terrify Film Festival in Wellington as well. So oh, it's a big weekend. Yeah, it's Christmas for me next weekend. Yeah, Halloween, I know. And and Christmas, yeah. you know, everybody's like, oh my gosh, is it already here? That's Halloween for mm -hmm. us, right? We're like, yeah. oh, that's right. I have all these other things I wanted to do. <laughs> so, yeah. Excellent. Right, how about you, Tim? Yeah, so I've I come two weeks ago now, my uh, new novel was published. Uh, this is my um, second novel. And uh, let's, I've realized that the background of my call is it's got the same colors as the novel, which I'd like to say is very cunning marketing on my part. It's actually coincidence. This is it. It's called Emergency Weather, and it's a climate fiction, a very near future climate fiction novel. So it's I've seen it described some places as a dystopian novel. Well, that's true if we're living in a dystopia at the moment, because this is basically 
uh, climate change hits Wellington with, with with a bang and how do my characters respond. So yeah, that's been, uh, I've just sort of finished a run of publicity things for that, which has been great, but a bit exhausting. There's a few more to come, but my, uh, my next event is the one Denver just mentioned. So I'm looking forward to meeting folks at that. Awesome, awesome. I think we're going to be seeing a lot of climate change, uh, climate horror and eco horror in the future from everyone. <laughs> so, how about you, Celine? Um, I am tricky to find anywhere, actually. I'm quite mysterious like that. But I was in an anthology uh, that came out recently called Unquiet Spirits, which is also about horror. And has been featured on, on Angela's channel um, and, and the Asian perspective on horror. And um, uh, I won't be in Wellington, unfortunately, uh, but I am branching into poetry a bit more. So you might see me when you see me. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. How about you, Dan? Uh, I've got well, I've got this going on. I'm not quite sure how I can make myself sound like a busy writer, um, and then also say I don't really have much else going on at the moment because uh, life is just a little bit overwhelming in that regard right at the moment. Um, but I've got this, and as, as Tim mentioned, we've got a launch event in Wellington coming up uh, next month, which which will be fun. And I'm just going to see what next year brings. That's awesome. Well, you can also always just say, I have a lot of things I'm not at liberty to talk about right now. <laughs> <laughs> if I did, I would say that, but I'll be honest. <laughs> My team has advised me that uh, I just... That's, right. <laughs> uh, that's, right. <laughs> that's funny. Well, hopefully we will have uh, a message from Tracy McBride. I'm going to try to get that before we post this. Um, but and she will also be down in the link so you can find her information as well. Um, and I apologize about that te technical difficulty. I blame the ghosts from down under. I blame all of the ghosts from Kiwiland coming in and doing that. <laughs> so, well, thank you guys so much for being here on the show. Thank you for reading. Thank you for your input. Thank you for freaking us all out with your scary stories. We love it. And yeah, everybody go to the links and buy this book. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Angela. Thank Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. See y'all next week on Exercise Your Rights. All right. Bye-bye. Peace.